Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this afternoon's Speakers Forum. I'd really like to thank you for coming along. Um, I thought I'd just start by introducing our really excellent speakers that we have today. We're really, really lucky to have some of the leading thinkers about this problem within the law school and within the profession here with us today. So Marie Jepson is the co-founder of and, the, and director of the Tristan Jepson Memorial Foundation. The foundation was established in 2008 and it really fills a gap in raising awareness about re resilience strategies and raising awareness about depression and anxiety within our own profession. Prue Vines has been one of the most remarkable members of our faculty since she started at the faculty in 1990, as well as being, um, you know, um, having great expertise in her particular areas of law in tort law and succession law. She's also been a really um, primary figure in developing resilience strategies within our law school as the as the staff coordinator of the First Year's Mentoring Program, otherwise known as Law MSN, and as well as being the First Year Coordinator. She's um, been a central figure in raising students' awareness about how to look after their friends and how to identify problems that students face. Professor Keith Mason is the former president of the New South Wales Court of Appeal, and he was the formerly the chairman of the New South Wales Law Reform Commission, and he was also the former Solicitor General of New South Wales. Furthermore, Professor Mason is now a director of the Tristan Jepson Memorial Foundation, and he's a key part of that foundation, and, and we're really lucky to have him here today to kind of discuss um, these, the issues at hand. So basically what we'd like the speakers to address for us today is to talk a little bit about why law students in particular are more susceptible to depression and anxiety than the general student population and also other professions and to talk about what we can do as students within the law school about how to develop our own resilience and how to identify um, um, problems within our friends and what to do when problems arise. Um, so without further ado, I'd love to welcome our first speaker, Professor Mason. Thank you. Uh, as has been mentioned, the Tristan Jepson Memorial Foundation uh, was established by Bari uh, Jepson and her husband George. Uh, it was to commemorate uh, their late son Tristan, a graduate of this law school, a talented young lawyer who took his own life as a result of depression. Uh, the Jepsons wanted to raise awareness of the incidence of depression in the legal profession uh, and most importantly to do something about it and in this uh, they have achieved incredible things. I won't uh, tell you about the various things that the Foundation has done and is doing because I'll focus on the topic that we've been, uh, we have been set. Studies here and abroad have documented an unusually high incidence of depression within those studying law and within the legal profession itself. The Brain and Mind Institute's 2008 survey of lawyers and law students found that over 35% of the law students studied suffered from high to very high levels of psychological distress and that almost 40% reported distress severe enough to warrant clinical or medical intervention. This contrasted with just over 17% of medical students and 13% of the general population. Similarly, a significant proportion of lawyers surveyed were found to suffer from elevated levels of anxiety and depression with 31% falling in the high to very high levels of psychological distress. A slightly earlier survey administered to approximately 5,000 students at this university aimed generally at plumbing student attitudes and expectations confirmed significant differences between law students and others. Law students reported different reasons for their choice of course. They seemed disproportionately concerned about their grades, were less interested in teamwork, and had different ideas about employers' preferences for graduates when compared with students from other disciplines. This may indicate high levels of competitiveness and reduced interest in what the psychologists call as social connectedness traits that are not likely to be helpful for maintaining sound mental health in individuals who may be at risk. Part of the problem that uh, is encountered at just about every level of society is that people do not treat the risk of mental illness seriously 
uh, it may be mentioned with a, a little bit of a, of a giggle uh, or uh, a bit of shyness. People, uh, even if they do recognise that they are suffering um, from stress, and not all stress betokens mental illness, some stress is, is good stress <coughs> and has good outcomes. So please don't think just because you're stressed you're, you, you are uh, in need of, of medical assistance. But for many people, uh, stress can betoken uh, some species of illness and it is like a cold or a cough or something more serious, an illness that is maybe diagnosable, may take many forms and in most cases can be treated and alleviated if it is addressed. If it's not, the consequences, as we all know, can be serious for the person, him or herself, uh, and, and for that person's family. Fortunately, society, societal attitudes are changing somewhat. People are prepared to talk about it. There have been champions such as Professor McGorry that have been um, campaigning for, for funding. Uh, but again, I, I come back to the point that a lot of it amount, counts upon the attitude of the individual concerned uh, and the assistance and awareness that his or her parents and friends can bring to bear upon uh, a situation. Hopefully the faculty uh, uh, is also doing all that it can to identify, assist and minimise uh, these problems. So one thing we w perhaps can discuss, uh, is there something about law something about uh, what attracts people like us to law that make us more um, concerned, more perfectionist, more concerned about making mistakes? Is there something about the profession, uh, uh, the, the education of law, that, that everybody is going it alone, and not sharing problems the way, for example, medical students, all of whom know they'll get a job, and work cooperatively? Is there something, a fear that I've got to succeed, I've got to beat the person next to me? Uh, and that in turn breeds uh, a self-concern and can, can have dangerous consequences. Um, the lawyers, I think, would know better than others, although much still needs to be done um, about duties of care that various institutions, teachers, employers have towards people. These include duties sometimes of being proactive to make sure that reasonable steps are taken to make an environment safe. Um, the law doesn't seem to have much problem about being paternalistic when it's a question of whirring blades in a sausage factory, but there's still a long way to go in a recognition that the dangers and con potential consequences of mental illness are every bit as serious, every bit as foreseeable, foreseeable uh, and every bit as demanding some reasonable attention as the traditional whirring blades of the, the, the traditional uh, personal injury um, problem. The final matter I just want to touch on is the whole question of uh, life after um, law school. Uh, many, many uh, students will be applying for, competing for jobs in, in the big firms. And uh, one of the matters that is of concern to the Jepson Foundation is the culture of the large law firms in particular, which while being legitimately driven by profit uh, motive, combined with a professional interest uh, and all the other things that makes for, for a, a good and keen lawyer, uh, th there is a culture that we perceive whereby um, there are so many people coming into the system that the system is quite happy to churn them up and spit them out and if, if they don't 
cope, well, that's their problem. And uh, the, the, there are plenty more where they come from. And this legal cultural attitude is continuing all the way through. It's not just something that hits the young graduates and leads to burnout, but it's hitting the, the, uh, the people, the wannabe partners and the partners. They are all constantly looking over their shoulder about their capacity to generate um, uh, profits. Uh, they're going home with their BlackBerry turned on, they're going on holidays with their BlackBerry turned on, all of the, all of the things that are now part and parcel of, of modern life, but all of which can do their bit to not necessarily to create, but to trigger the consequences uh, or to exacerbate the problems of stress. I've said enough. Uh, I think Mary is now going to tell us a slightly more positive uh, message. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Keith. Um, I'm talking about resilience strategies for law students and I'd like to say this isn't going to solve all your problems. But each of us has the personal responsibility to develop his or her own re resilience. That's notwithstanding responsibilities from faculty and whatever, but we each have our own responsibility. We need to give ourselves permission to do some of the things that are good for us. And as certain as death and taxes is the fact that we cannot control our environment and what happens to us. And we need to remember that we are all vulnerable. Research shows that law students and lawyers have few life skills. Resilience is hanging in there for the long haul. It's important to build our skills and this takes time and energy. It doesn't happen by osmosis. A few years ago at the Winter Olympics, an Australian won gold in the speed skating. At the outset, he didn't have a prayer. He wasn't in the running for a medal. However, he won gold because there was a massive collision amongst the other racers all vying for gold. He was the only one still skating. He just kept hanging in there and won the first gold medal in speed skating history in Australia. He was resilient. The following comments have been taken from Dr. Lichty's presentation at the Resilience Workshop at the ALSA conference. And she asked, what is resilience? Edith Grotberg defines resilience as the ability to face, overcome, be strengthened by, or even transformed by experiences of adversity. And that's any situation which reduces one's ability to function productively. This does not mean you bounce back immediately, but can you invent yourself maybe so that you're able to come back in a different form? For example, if you don't get that strived for summer clerkship, are you shattered? Is it the end of things or do you have plan B? Maybe spend the summer working for an NGO or a rural lawyer. What if the unforeseen happens? And it's important to note that personal resilience is a self-assessment and it's based on observable evidence and it's not measured by universal measurement. It changes and evolves a degree of optimism and positive attitude. So how do you become more resilient? It's made up of three parts, circumstances, needs and personal experiences. Grotberg's paradigm incorporates three things. I have, I am and I can. Ask yourself, do I have a family who makes me feel valued? If they don't, they don't add to your resilience. Someone close by. A mentor who is non-judgmental and who has moral integrity. A significant other I can truly rely on. A young lawyer in South Australia told me she shared her academic readings with a friend. It halved the work, shared the insights, because two heads are better than one, and a problem share is a problem halved, and they both supported each other. Win-win. Do you have a friend or friends who are honest and supportive? I'm not talking about your drinking mates. Do I have something that I'm passionate about or interested in outside of work? Maybe join a touch footy team which encourages French and encourage friendships outside of the law. 
That'll give you a totally different perspective and it also gives exercise and a team sport. Professor Mason takes time out by going camping and on walking trips. It's important to note that time and energy are required to develop these I have relationships. They do not thrive on neglect. Ask yourself, am I? Am I a person people like and value? A person who empathises with others? Am I respectful of myself and others? And am I willing to be responsible for what I do? And the key is being confident in your identity and responsible for your actions. And this might require reframing how you think. Perhaps you can recall being very disappointed in an essay result. I thought about this as I was running late for this seminar and thought as I was getting rather annoyed I should reframe and say I've now had the ability to get some exercise that I mightn't have had for the rest of the day. It wasn't easy, let me tell you. <laughs> Thomas Edison wrote, I have not failed. I have just found 10,000 ways that won't work. And Henry Ford commented that failure is only the opportunity to begin again more intelligently. So how can we do this? We need to set achievable goals. We need, need to take responsibility to change our behaviour when it's necessary. And we need to re-evaluate our goals regularly in the light of new information. What's really important? And finally, can I? Can I find ways to solve my problems? Can I control myself when I feel impulsive? And thirdly, can I find someone to help me when I need it? And this is critical, recognising and seeking help. Being able to seek help is a strength, not a weakness. It shows you are self-aware and personally responsible. In the caring professions of psychiatry, social work and psychology, going to supervision is a mandatory professional development. It's essential for you to be the best possible practitioner. Maybe law students and lawyers could learn from this. Find yourself a GP, not one like TV's Doc Martin. One who is available, is able to listen and empathise is solution focused, someone who considers your issues important. And remember that your GP is not a mind reader. Des describing your symptoms succinctly does assist in the diagnosis. So what are some I can tips? Surround yourself with experts in whom you have faith and use them. Be willing to put energy and effort into learning new skills and be open to the professional advice which runs counter to your preconceived ideas. On the whole side of a building in Manhattan's Upper West Side, there is a sign which says, depression is not a flaw in character, but a flaw in chemistry. Sadly, lawyers feel they need to go it alone to prove that they are not weak or finding the kitchen too hot. And I'd like to share with you the Ten Commandments to relieve stress. They're not mine. Number one, thou shalt not be perfect or even try to be. Number two, thou shalt not try to be all things to all people. Number three, thou shalt not spread thyself too thin. Number four, thou shalt leave some things undone even those that ought to be done. Number five, thou shalt learn to say no. Number six, thou shalt schedule time for thyself and thy support network. Number seven, thou shalt switch off regularly and do absolutely nothing. And ladies, this one's for you. Thou shalt be lazy, untidy, <laughs> inelegant and unattractive at times. <laughs> number nine, thou shalt not even feel guilty. And number ten, and especially, thou shalt not be thine own worst enemy, and thou shalt be thine own best friend. 
we know that one of the biggest challenges for law students is the self-talk that we give. And I'd like to close with the lessons from geese. And it's by Milton Olson, and he was in North America, and he was talking about the geese that flew down south in the winter. Fact one. As each goose flaps its wings, it creates an uplift for the birds to follow. By following in a V formation, the whole flock adds 71% greater flying range than if each bird flew alone. Lesson. People who share a common direction and sense of community can get where they are going quicker and easier because they are travelling on the thrust of one another. Fact two, when a goose falls out of formation, it suddenly feels the drag and resistance of flying alone. It quickly moves back into formation to take advantage of the lifting power of the bird immediately in front of it. Lesson, if we have as much sense as a goose, we stay in formation with those headed where we want to go. We are willing to accept their help and to give our help to others. Fact three, when the lead goose tires, it rotates back into formation and another goose flies to the point opposite. Lesson, it pays to take turns doing the hard tasks and sharing leadership. As with geese, people are interdependent on each other's skills, capabilities and unique arrangements of gifts, talents and resources. Fact four, the geese flying in formation honk to encourage those up front to keep up with their speed. Lesson, we need to make sure that our honking is encouraging. In groups where there is encouragement, to stand by one's heart or core values and encourage the heart and core of others, this is the encouragement we seek. And fact five, when a goose gets sick, wounded or shot down, Two geese drop out of formation and follow it down to help and protect it. They stay with it until it dies or is able to fly again. Then they launch out with another formation or catch up with their own flock. And the lesson? If we have as much sense as geese, we will stand by each other in difficult times, as well as when we are strong. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to thank um, Professor Mason and, and Mary Jepson because, um, in particular Mary, because without the energy and um, force and effort that she's put into this, I don't think these sorts of forums would be happening at the rate that they are happening. And I think it is a very important thing that we um, normalise some of this, that we talk about um, the, the problems that you might face in a way that doesn't that doesn't make them worse, but actually leads people towards thinking about resilience and making things better for people and for themselves. Um, so I have quite limited time because it's important that you get to ask questions. So I just briefly wanted to touch on a couple of things. One is that the research that, um, that we carried out in New South Wales some time ago, which Professor Mason referred to, the, there's two things about that research that I think were really striking. One was the the discovery that compared with medical students, law students were far less likely to be doing law for a reason that was internal to them. So they were much more likely to be doing it because somebody else wanted them to. Now if you think about the ramifications of that, um, it, it means people talking about motivations that are not internal. And if you think about that a little bit, you can see why that might ultimately cause problems. This is not to say that every law student is like this but it was a much higher proportion. It was, it was something approaching 40% compared with about 17% of medical students. So that's a significant thing. The other one, there were a whole lot of other things, um, which if you go to my website and look on the, um, you will be able to find um, the references to some of this literature if you want to look it up. Um, but the other thing I just wanted to talk about briefly was there was a tendency 
a greater tendency amongst law students to see their friends and their social connections as useful rather than simply as good people to be with, people I love, etc. Now both of those things are significant if we think about depression in particular as very often about people feeling a lack of um, autonomy, a lack of sense that they have control over their lives and the other thing being a lack of social connectedness. Um, seeing your friend as a person who's likely to be able to help you get a job is not really the same as having a very good sense of social connectedness. So, um, so when we've been thinking at, in the law school about how we can do things that will actually assist in relation to these issues, um, we've, we've taken a number of steps. But first of all, I want to say that we have taken the view that we don't, it's not our job to become counsellors. It is our job to do our best to create the best, most resilient, um, whole lawyers and professions of other kinds, because we know that many law students do not end up as lawyers, um, and to assist people to um, do their work in such a way that they are not only thriving as law students and as lawyers, but actually, in many cases, being enriched by the process. And that's what we're trying to achieve. I know we don't always succeed, but that's what we're trying to do. Um, a number of strategies, UNSW has had a lot of strategies associated with this sort of thing for some time. The first is the Peer Tutor Program, which started in 1996. Um, is really an academic program, but one of its goals has been to teach students to deal with uncertainty. Um, and that is one of the people have real trouble with uncertainty. It makes people anxious. And, um, and of course, many people, like myself, when I came to law, I thought, oh, I'll come to law and they'll tell me what the rules are and then I'll know what's what. And of course, that wasn't what I found when I got here. What I found was more messes and a lot more uncertainty about uh, what was really going on and I had to get used to that. Many law students need to get used to that. So the process of developing resilience involves looking at a lot of things such as how you get used to uncertainty. Um, the mentoring program in which I've been involved to do some training of mentors, in that program my goal has been to train mentors to normalise the asking for help. Because we know that law students are very clever, they know that they're clever, even though some of them think that they're imposters, but we know they really are clever. If you're here, you really are clever, let me tell you, it's all right. Um, the, but we also know that they tend to think that because they're clever, they should solve their own problems. But, of course, you wouldn't dig a, you wouldn't dig a hole with a toothpick. You go and get the proper tool, you go and get a spade, or if you're lucky, a, a backhoe or something, if the hole's really big, you get the appropriate tool. So we want to normalise the asking for help and that's been part of the training of peer mentors. Um, not by making a big fuss about it, by saying, gee, people sometimes feel bad and you know, you can go and get help and very often that help will um, resolve the problem completely. If it doesn't, it can alleviate it. So that's another thing. We've changed law, lawyers and society. I think it still needs significant changes. Um, but to, to address some of these, of these issues, um, we have changed how we train our first year teachers. Um, again, in order to try and, and teach them to normalise the asking for help, being um, modelling respect for various people in the community, in, uh, modelling respect for students and so on. Um, because all of these things, the enhancing of and developing people's internal motivation is what we need to be looking at. One of the problems that all law students and medical students have that is a common problem is that they all come in having been very, very good, having got very, very high marks, and then they hit something where everybody else is as clever as they are, which necessarily means that a number of you, in fact, 99% of you are not going to be on top anymore. That's a dramatic shift for many people. But, what we, but the thing that puzzled us was why was it that law students reacted worse to that than medical students did? And it seems to be because, my thesis is, it's because more law students are doing law for other people's reasons and for reasons and are used to being motivated by things that are external to themselves. If you come in and you do law because you love law and you want to get on with it and because so that you can go out and be calm, um, a human rights lawyer in Outer Mongolia. That's an internal motivation. 
And whether you get 65%, 90% or something in between is going to be a matter of interest perhaps, a little bit of a frisson, but it's not going to be the thing that drives you. If, if your mark is a thing that drives you, you're in trouble. That's an external motivator. So we need to be talking to people about focusing on their internal motivation. And um, so we are trying to do this partly by our training of teachers and, and getting, we cannot get rid of marks. We know that does other things that cause other problems. So we can't do that. But we can suggest that you can be working very hard for some kind of goal. And if you're making sure your goal's an internal goal, the pain of not getting that HD will not be so great. <laughs> Um, because you'll still know you're working towards the goal and you're learning and you do things like you begin to think about the fact that I learnt something. In my last assignment I got 65% and in this one I got 70%. I'm improving against my own um, indicators and so on. That's really important. So, um, so very briefly, the next thing I want to talk about is a new initiative that has just begun which is that we have set up um, on our new website there is a, a new web page called the Surviving and Thriving at UNSW website. It's very new and at the moment it doesn't do nearly as much as I would like it to do and what it will eventually do. But it does these things. It tries to cover, um, it covers things at what we know are the critical points for students, first year and fourth year in particular. That is the moment when you move into um, doing electives and then summer clerkship kind of programs rear their ugly heads and cause all sorts of trauma. Um, the aim of this website is to show people where they can get help, yes, and to show them paths to track through the academic things, yes, but also to show you that being a lawyer and a law student can be a wonderful thing. It can be an enriching thing. It's a wonderful mental exercise, it's the area of, it's, an, it's one of the areas of work where you can really make a difference in the world and know you've made a difference. It's a place where if you have a passion for justice you can really be idealistic and really do something. There are absolutely wonderful things about doing law beyond just the, the nice intellectual games that you can play as well, which I enjoy very much, thank you. Um, but I think, but I think it's, um, we really need to see there are legal heroes in the world. We're all used to people talking about the fact that, you know, the first thing we do, we kill the lawyers. But, uh, but you know, there are some real heroes in the law, some of them in Australia, people who are doing things, putting themselves on the line because they think something about the rule of law or human rights or, or, in, or discrimination or something is important. Those people are real heroes. What about all the pro bono work that gets done by lawyers? It's one of the few professions that actually really puts its money where its mouth is. And yet they pretend it's not happening as if it's something to be ashamed of. So one of the things we're trying to do with this website is also show you that you can enrich your life. You can have a rich and wonderful life as a lawyer. You can develop resilience by doing things like going beyond law into literature, into music, into other things. You can connect those up and become one of those very enriched people whose resilience is enhanced because they've done things that uh, make their, fill their minds and give them wonderful things to think about. There are enormously wonderful things that we can do. Um, now at the moment if you go to, the, I would like you to go and have a look at the website, but it is at the moment a very, it's, it's a bit skeletal I have to say, um, and I'm hoping it will, it will build up. But there are things on it, there are, there are YouTube videos, there are podcasts that we've um, created, there are various documents by people including looking at where you go in your career and so on. But most of all, it's about celebrating one of the things that you're here for, which is to be doing law for whatever reasons you're doing it, but to be seeing it as something that you can see as a great positive in your life and using that to enhance your resilience because it's that kind of thing that gives you the power and the resilience to go and into the world and do, do the things that you want to do. And the reason that you do it is because you yourself want to do it, because you yourself see it as important. As um, Mari said, it's, um, resilience is a matter of self-assessment. 
the, the, I, my theory is that many law students are suffering from a lack of self-assessment, far too much assess, allowing assessment by other people to govern their lives and not enough self-assessment. It takes practice to self-assess. It takes practice to develop these things, as Mari was saying. What she was saying was very important, but it, isn't, but it isn't something that you just learn by hearing it the first time. You need to practice it. Um, anyway, I have gone on too long, and I think it's really important that you raise issues that you're concerned about, um, and um, so that Mari and Keith and I can answer any of your questions. Um, but I think, one of, but before I finish, I just want to talk about another thing, and that's failure. Mari mentioned failure. In my opinion, many law students have not, before they come, have not experienced very much failure at all. If you go to this new website, you'll see J.K. Rowling's address to, I think it was Harvard, about the value of failure. Um, that, value, that, that kind of failure does assist in developing your resilience. So I suggest that you have a look at that if you haven't seen it already. Um, and I think we open it up to questions now.